Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 24 through 26, New International Version. Hello, welcome back to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. I'm Victoria Kay, and in the studio today we are continuing the new series we began last time on Anchored by Truth, featuring Jay Ammerman. Jay has a truly amazing story. After being an Army combat medic and enduring three deployments with frontline infantry, Jay came home and began working in a hospital. Unfortunately, he also returned from combat with an addiction to opiate painkillers. But he was completely delivered from that addiction through his faith in Christ. That has led Jay to a place where he is almost finished with his seminary study. As you can see, Jay's life has included its share of twists and turns. But his faith in Christ has grown so steadily that he has now been called by the Lord to full-time service. So let's welcome Jay Ammerman, the owner of Black Thumb Services, to Anchored by Truth. Jay, your story is amazing. But the one constant throughout has been the presence of Christ. That's why when we met you, we thought it would be so amazing for you to share your passion about Christ with the listeners. And when we found out that one subject that you really wanted to discuss was the miracles Christ performed during his earthly ministry, it seemed like a good idea to get the show started by playing one of our life lessons with a laugh on the miracles of Christ. So, let's listen to one of those. This one has to do with how Jesus calmed a storm on the Sea of Galilee. Whoa, R.D., R.D., What's going on around here? I thought we were going to get started on our next life lesson on the miracles of Jesus. And why am I staring at four swamp buggy sized fans? I mean, these things are huge. Just a sec, Jerbreeze, just a sec. Be right. That number four lateral squirrel cage blower is still misaligned and it's still surging. It's not the number four lateral RD. As I have told you, the number nine aft centrifugal channel duct has a crimp. Compensating. Number four lateral? Number nine centrifuge? Are we on a submarine? RD, really, what is going on? Just a sec, Breezy J. Just a sec. Oh, I think you mean Jerry. Got to greet the Crystal Sea guests. Hi, folks. R.D. Fierro, here to talk more about miracles in the Bible. Today, we're going to talk about one of the most famous miracles Jesus ever performed. Of course, I'm talking about that famous episode involving wind and waves in Matthew chapter 8. Be right, what do verses 23 and 24 say? Then, Jesus got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. Wait a minute, R.D. You're not going to create a storm in the recording room, are you? No, R.D. is not going to. No, but that doesn't mean I can't. R.D., you know that water and recording equipment don't get along, don't you? Don't you? Of course I do, Jerbreeze. I mean, how silly do you think I am? Well, actually, I... You do not need to fear for the equipment, Jerbreeze. I canceled the order for the industrial strength spray equipment and three-inch hose connection RD ordered. But even after B-Wright nixed the wave simulation, 
I figured we could still get a feeling of stormy authenticity eh, with a couple of fans. A couple? It looks like you've got, what, 20, 25 fans in here. 28. 28! If you count all the various varieties of blowers. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised you wore shorts today. I told you to expect some big wind today. Yeah, well, I just figured you were going back to Mama Libby's again and getting their special like you did last week. Remember, be right? I remember. I remember. Two double-stuffed extra guacamole bacon-wrapped twice-fried chimichangas with jalapeno cheese topping with beans. Talk about a big wind. Hey, I had another coupon. Anyway, let's get back to our verse from Matthew. Be right, are we just about ready? Running final test, now. (laughs) What was that? I just felt a chill in all the wrong places, but it was kind of nice. Well, we wanted you to feel like you're there in the boat with Jesus. Did you notice the part about suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake? So, uh, you might want to put on those safety goggles that we put on your mic stand. Safety goggles? What? Triple strength, diamond cured, extra thick, polycarbonate to be exact. What? Why? Yeah, don't wait. I'm serious now. Uh, Do it. Do it now. Furious Gale on Sea of Galilee program. Do it now. Activating now. How do you feel now, Gerberese? Uh, to be honest, like, I'm ready to get out of the boat. And that's exactly how Jesus' disciples felt. Be right, verses 40 and 41. And Jesus said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear, and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, You would have thought the disciples would be celebrating, wouldn't you? I mean, Jesus had just calmed the storm, literally. But oh no. I, of course, would have been fine. But the human heart, when confronted with the holiness of God, is always filled with fear. You see, Gerberese, the disciples had just been confronted with a miracle that proved Jesus not only had control over the elements in nature, like when he turned water into wine, but that Jesus also had control over the forces of nature. The disciples were awestruck, literally. You know, some people have called me a force of nature. Uh, no. <laughs> no. No, no, no I way. I don't think not so. Not even close. No, uh, no way. No, no, no. Sorry, no. dude. No. Look, I get that Jesus calmed the storm. I've always said, storms may come and block the sun, but with Jesus in your boat, you'll always stay afloat. But what I don't get is why you felt it necessary to blast enough air through my shorts to freeze french fries on a flat top grill. Well, we had to produce a big wind for a big miracle, Gerbreeze. You know, go big or go home. Actually, to God who is all-powerful, no miracle can truly be called big. R.D. is speaking as a human, which, of course, is all he can do. I, on the other hand, do see the big picture. Okay, I've had enough of big pictures, big miracles, and certainly big wind. So, I'm going home, and I need to change my, uh, 
Close. Uh, are you going past Mama Libby's? Well, yes. But no, I'm not stopping and getting you anything. The last thing we want around here is the need for another gale to clear the air. Thank goodness, Jabriz. I thought I was going to have to transfer to the offsite backup location again. But I've still got this other coupon. Hey, number four lateral just blew my coupon out the window. <laughs> no problem, R.D. I'll pick it up on my way out and throw it away. Good job, B. Right. The I in A.I. does mean intelligence, Breezy J. You should know that by now. Well, that's it from Jeremy. Oh, and it's still Jerry. Sure, still Jerry. Sure. Me, R.D., and the whole Crystal Sea Blower crew for today. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalseabooks.com, where we're We're not perfect, perfect, but our boss is. is. So, Jay, what are some of the first things we should learn from the very powerful demonstration of Jesus' power over wind and water? Attending a Baptist seminary and growing up to be a Southern Baptist and aspiring to be a Southern Baptist preacher, there's one thing I noticed that we Baptists do more than most any other denomination. And I've been to many. When I was in the Army, I visited, you know, you name kind of Christian church denominations, even some that didn't speak English. And none of them did this one thing that Baptists do better than anybody. And that is use alliteration to make three or four points for a message. And so being a good Baptist, I have to offer the four Ps of Matthew 8. And so that would be the power, Jesus' authority over nature, the promise of faith and trust in Jesus, peace, Jesus as a source of peace, and perseverance, the call to follow Jesus despite challenges. So that would be power, promise, peace, and perseverance. And so with any miracle story, the most obvious and glaring highlighting feature is going to be the fact that this person demonstrated God-like powers, little hint, he was also God, And so you can't help but see that when you see a man stand up on the boat and tell the waves and the wind to stop and everything goes away. So the passage definitely highlights Jesus' divine power and authority. It emphasizes his sovereignty over creation and reinforces belief in his divinity. But it's interesting, though, that this amazing act, this miracle that Jesus did, kind of led to a crisis of faith and terror the experience of his disciples. And you know, they talk about being afraid and have little faith. You know, they didn't know what was going on. And this speaks to a Bible accuracy point that I'd like to mention here. And it's that people who make up a religion or are trying to create a story so that they can control the narrative, they're not likely to put things like, I was scared and I didn't know what was going on. These kind of admissions are the kind of admissions that was recording their honest testimony. You know, warts and all. You just want to tell them, this is what happened, man. I was scared. It was nuts. Then Jesus stood up and it was over. This kind of story speaks to Bible accuracy. And so in the power, we see these attributes. So your first P is power. One thing we should note about Jesus' miracle of calming the Sea of Galilee was that it was a clear display of divine power. And it's important to note that Jesus could exercise divine power because Jesus was fully divine as well as being fully human. That's an attribute that is true of no other religious figure or human being. Jesus could calm the wind and the waves because he had made the wind and the waves. Jesus could do miracles through his own power because he is God. How about your second P, promise? The promise, the second P is promise. You know, the disciples, their response to the storm, them waking Jesus up, it speaks to a lack of trust in Jesus. And I've always kind of been shocked that Jesus responded by saying, you have little faith. Like, I mean, obviously they have faith in them. They're with him. They're following him. They've left their jobs. They no longer fish. They're doing their thing. They're following Jesus with all they got. Yet Jesus said they had little faith. And That's where we need to pick up the context from Luke or Mark. See, both of those Gospels have one or two more lines in them. As I said, Matthew likes to keep things just the bare facts. And we learn that Jesus himself said, let's cross the other side. 
That would be diethylamine es taparan, if you want to know the Greek. But it literally means, let us go to the other side. Like, come on, guys, let's go. So he said, we're going to go to the other side of the lake. And so when they woke him up freaking out, they're basically saying, I don't believe you that we're going to make it to the other side of the lake. This was their lack of faith. Jesus, like, basically, he's like, what do you think? This is my version of Jesus talking here. What do you think? I'd tell you to cross the lake if we're going to go out here and drown and die just to end it before I'm even glorified? What are you, crazy? I'm sure he didn't say it like that. That's kind of more like Jay's playing the role. But anyway, why did Jesus respond the way they did? Because he had said, let's cross the lake. What I also love is the idea of why they crossed the lake. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But an interesting point here is I think about the storms. And and this is not the only time we see storms arise in the Gospels around this Sea of Galilee. See, the Sea of Galilee itself is positioned in such a way that it exposes it to abrupt, fierce storms. Nice warm air comes off the Mediterranean and blows inland, and as it rises up, it comes in contact with cold, dense mountain air right there at the point where the lake is. And so you have these perfect conditions with the cold, heavy air sinking and the hot, moist air rising coming together and just stirring up a mess. I grew up in Panama City Beach, and so it seems like every afternoon it would rain for about an hour for that very same reason. You had that hot, humid air coming in, and it would come in over this cooler land air, and it would mix and make an afternoon storm. And so we find that the Bible here is also geographically and meteorologically correct and accurate, according to everything we know today. But that's just a side point. The main point for us here is to remind us of the importance of trusting in Jesus, even amid challenging circumstances. He said, let's cross, and God will always honor his promises, his word, and so our faith is well-placed in him. So the promise of Jesus that he will deliver us is powerful. All right, we've covered two of your four Ps. The first P we've seen from Jesus calming the storm was that it was a display of divine power. The second P was that calming the storm was part of Jesus fulfilling the promise that he was going to get his disciples safely across what is well known to be a temperamental body of water. So, what is your third P? The third P is peace. Jesus is our source of peace. He is peace personified in a lot of ways. For one, we see here in the narrative that the second Jesus stands up and says, peace be still, he calms the winds, he calms the seas, it's done in an instance, demonstrating his ability to bring tranquility to turbulent situations. It would have been wise for the disciples to remember Proverbs 10, 25, which says, when the whirlwind passes, the wicked are no more, but the righteous are secure forever. If the storm represents chaos and turmoils of life, of death, Jesus represents the source of true peace. You know, this should help us to believe to turn to Jesus for solace, serenity amidst the storms of life. But Jesus as the peacemaker, as one who brings peace, is backed up. See, in all three Gospels, after the storm, when they finish to the other side, they go meet this demoniac, this guy who's been tortured his whole life. He's in pain, he's suffering, he's chained up to rocks and graves sometimes. Bad news. But the whole reason they crossed was so that Jesus could heal him and bring peace to him. And so when you see themes grouped together in scripture, they kind of highlight a greater point. And so Jesus could bring peace in that storm and brings peace in the lives of these men. Jesus is the source of peace. And Jesus is not just a source of peace. He is the source of all real peace. I like your point that Jesus calmed the sea of the storm so he could go and calm the storm that was raging in the man on the far shore. What a powerful statement. The demon-possessed man did not know that peace was available, but Jesus brought it anyway. But Jesus had to arrive for it to come. As Jesus' disciples in the world today, we have to be the ones who bring Jesus' peace to those who need it. But you don't yet know it's available. So what is your fourth P? Lastly, the fourth P is perseverance. We're called to follow Jesus despite challenges. The disciples' experience on the boat underscores the challenges and hardships that can accompany the journey of discipleship. And that's then, now, and always. 
That's a wonderful thing I love about the Bible. It's unique ability to speak to people of ancient days, in ancient Greece, people that have Hebrew backgrounds, Romans, and Americans today, people from all over the world, be it even Russia and China. They can hear and understand the Bible message. We all know what it's like to be helpless in a storm. But it also reminds us to look for God's presence, recognizing God's presence in the storm. Jesus, he was there in the boat. He didn't have to go on the boat with him. He could have walked around. We find out later he could have just walked across the lake to the other side. But he wasn't. He was with his men during the tough time. He was physically present in the boat with the disciples. He might have appeared asleep. That's okay, because it reminds us that God is always with us in the midst of our own storm, even when it seems like he's not. Perseverance in faith involves acknowledging God's presence and seeking his guidance and relying on his strength during the challenging times. Jesus didn't avoid trouble. He knew the mission. He knew it was worthwhile. He knew the storms were coming. But still, he said, come on, y'all, let's cross the lake to save the demoniac. And he crossed from heaven to earth to save me and to save you. If we persevere in the faith, it will be a great day when we meet the Father. For us today, our storms are the worries and pains of life. This scene from the lives of Jesus and his followers can serve as a metaphor for the trials and challenges we encounter on our faith journey. And just like Jesus calmed the storm, he can calm your storm too. He offers us strength and guidance to persevere through difficulties. It reminds us that faith requires steadfastness and endurance. Even when circumstances seem overwhelming, Jesus is waiting there to calm the storm. Well, that's a great point. Just because few of us don't sail on the Sea of Galilee doesn't mean we don't have our own storms. We do. And Jesus will bring us peace in the storm if we turn to Him. But we must turn with persevering trust. Too many times we want to turn the boat around as soon as we see dark clouds on the horizon. We must persevere with Jesus if we want His peace and power to calm our storms. Now you said R.D. asked you something when you two were talking about this miracle. What was that? R.D. asked me why I believe this is true. Of course, being a philosophy student as well, I came along with something along the lines, well, what is truth? You know, because I recently acquired this new little skill set of what types of truth there are. And so I wanted to flex it like I was smart. (laughs) So I said, well, there's the traditional idea of truth, the correspondence theory of truth. And that is kind of defined this way that truth in terms of correspondence or agreement between a statement or belief and the objective reality it represents basically It's true if it accurately describes or corresponds to the facts of the external world. In other words, its correspondence is true if it's actually what happened. A more modern theory of truth is this coherence theory. It's actually a lower bar to make. And all you have to do here for coherence theory is, is the story or is the set of beliefs internally consistent and coherent to the set of other beliefs. So, of course, the Bible cross-references throughout the whole thing. The Gospels are synoptic. So, they definitely cohere in doctrines and teachings that all form this amazingly interconnected framework. And its internal consistency and coherence is crucial for its truth. So, it does cohere. The third type of truth, the one that's much more popular today, is this pragmatic theory of truth. To boil it down, it's basically like, you know, you do you. If it works for you, it works. This is the idea of pragmatic theory. It's often associated with the philosopher William James, and basically, it defines truth in terms of its practical consequences and usefulness. And I would say, without a doubt, the Bible has had a profound influence on human history, culture, ethics, and it continues to shape the lives of believers and societies. Its teaching and principles have practical implications for individuals and communities, for nations, It cannot be rejected by an evidence of the lives of countless Christians that the Bible is pragmatically true, and I can speak for my own life, it works for me. So, unless you're one to completely reject the truth, the Bible is true. The Bible is true pragmatically, it's true coherently, and it's true correspondently. 
It's true because it corresponds with what actually happened. R.D. often notes that truth must correspond with reality. If a truth claim cannot be shown to correspond to reality, then we must reject it. Numerous archaeological discoveries, as well as an abundant body of scientific evidence, supports the fact that the Bible's history is reliable. We'd really like to thank Jay for being our guest on Anchored by Truth today. He's given us some really great takeaways from this miracle. The miracle was an amazing display of Jesus' power, and it showed that Jesus not only can, but does keep his promises. Today, for our closing prayer, let's listen to a prayer for Christian missionaries, those who bring the saving power of the scriptures into places where it may never have been heard until their arrival. A Prayer for Christian Missionaries Father of Redemption, you are a powerful and loving God and our ever faithful tower of refuge and strength. You are a God who takes pleasure in rescuing lost sheep and in bringing them into your kingdom. You are the God of the ends and the means. May all the earth sing praises to your name. Lord, the Bible rightly asks how the lost can hear of the salvation available through Christ's life, death, and resurrection unless preachers are sent to proclaim the gospel. We know they cannot, and today, a great many of your faithful people continue to leave their families and homes to travel to remote corners to preach your message of hope and good news. Today, we want to pray for all these missionaries and to thank you for your provision of them. Lord, we know that many missionaries preach the gospel in lands where your word is not welcome. In fact, in some lands to speak about you brings a sentence of death. We know that there are many places where government leaders and authorities will exercise the full power of their offices to oppose and persecute your messengers. Therefore, we pray for special protection for all those who preach in these dangerous countries and places. We ask that you watch over these missionaries, protecting them as they travel and minister and confounding the efforts of those who seek their harm. We also pray that you give them fertile fields in which to plant your word, which is the seed of true life. We pray that you would open the hearts of those who hear the word. Give them the courage to accept Christ, even as they risk their lives to do so. Bring leaders out of the converted so that ministries and churches once begun will continue to grow and expand. Provide the resources the missionaries and churches need to sustain themselves, whether it be Bibles, educational literature, money, or resources for daily living. Show us how you would have us help and serve in bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. While not all are called to go or preach, we know that there is a way that all of us can contribute. Help us to be persistent in our prayers and make us fervent in our desire to see your word spread and your kingdom grow. Christ commanded that his word be spread until he returns again. So in his holy name we pray for his kingdom and his messengers. Amen. Amen. Is the Bible important in your life? Supporting Anchored by Truth with a contribution is an easy way to put your faith into action. The opportunity to help is available at crystalseabooks.com. How wonderful would it be for Jesus to commend us because we made his word a priority in our lives and giving. We are grateful for your support and partnership. We hope you'll be with us next time, and we hope you'll take some time to encourage friends to tune in also or to listen to the podcast version of this show. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalseabooks.com where We're not perfect, but our boss is. And for those of you who need that website one more time, that's crystalseabooks.com. Crystal, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L, C-S-E-A, 
and books, B-O-O-K-S dot com. Thank you for your support.